Right, welcome again, everyone. I think we are all set up now. So if uh, I can ask um, Omar, if you take the slide background and if I can ask the coordinators, please, if you turn on your camera and voice, because we would like really to, to be seen while we are talking. Sabih Gad and Majdi, could you please turn your cameras on and unmute yourselves? It's actually on. on uh, all just right, all right. Yes, I can see you now. Hi, Dr. Pisar Jamal. Hi, Dr. Sabih. Hi, Dr. Majdi. Hi, Mr. Uh, Dr. Tom. And, uh, Dr. Gad, are you with us? Yes, there. How are you? All right. <laughs> yes. <Congratulations. hello. laughs> I'm time everywhere. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you ever so much. Uh, I think this we are we decided to, to make that closing session as a kind of a moment of reflection and reporting. Uh, just I will start uh, and uh, <clears throat> just uh, and we'll try. We hopeful that uh, Dr. Jan Selim was one of the network coordinators. Unfortunately, Mike and Andrea are not with us today, but hopefully Dr. Jan can join us. In a minute. Uh, in general, just we decided to really make this concluding session in a way to reflect on a year of hard work and difficult circumstances and acknowledge the contribution of everyone reporting how the process has developed. And then we can really uh, give an idea of the future as well. Just give me a second. I'm trying to add Shihan, Shihan Selim. Kamal, could you also make Anusha co-host, please? Yes, just a second. Just we have, uh, we are very blessed with plenty of audience. So I'm trying to search for the names. <laughs> and if you can just enable Dr. Jian Salim to join us from the waiting room and then make her a co-host, please, if you can. Yes, just a second. Yes, here we are. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Thanks a lot for adding me. Um, Not at all, thanks, welcome, Jane. Yeah, here I am, yeah. All right. Uh, so this, this is, as I was about to say, that it is a, it has been an incredible journey. And to give just a few minutes, then we'll ask every hub coordinator to reflect on their experience, the way that the, the network hub evolved and uh, really reflect on that experience. And I, I will come back towards the end and then offer a little bit of a few steps that we hope to achieve together in the Engage Network. As a starting point, just I would like to reflect that the Engage Network has been effectively three years in the building. So it is not a while, this has been a year reflecting on the work, but the preparations, planning, engagement with our partners, deciding the, uh, the, the conceptual developments, the research agenda and how it evolved. It has been already three years as we speak today. We started to come together with some partners. We started to explore that there is a need to change the mo modalities and the thinking about the cultural heritage when it comes to marginalized communities, we realize as perhaps you have heard through many fantastic presentations over the past two and a half days from different cases across the globe that there are definitely a lot of the cultural heritage that what we see in the formal organizations or institutionalized research and reports, but is always off the radar. Not, not many people understand the, the importance of those communities the critical importance of their cultural heritage to the education, social well-being, and even economic resources and income for many people. And as perhaps we have highlighted in the first session, which we reflected on the conceptual, uh, theor theoretical, the uh, disciplinary uh, perspectives towards humanitarian heritage, how there is a much of a gap about our understanding of heritage, even tangible and intangible, through certain structured processes, but actually there is a humanitarian value and importance to the well-being of communities on a daily basis that's sometimes being overlooked. And that's why this 
network was established around really challenging this kind of internationalized on in, and institutionalized vision and trying to really find an alternative view whereby we can really work, collaborate and learn from communities from different challenges and try to find innovative solutions and new ways to undertake and deliver research informed actions. This network is an impact driven one. It was initially funded by the uh, Arts and uh, uh, Humanities Research Councils, the UK, and the global under the Global Challenges Research Fund. And we, when we designed it, we designed it for five years program, in which the first year would be about research development, working with the partners, developing schemes and scopes of work, and who are the relevant to this project, how we can really develop shared understanding, how to generate and develop networks and search for evidence on the basis that we do follow that with two years of develop, build, developing proof of concept projects, impact driven action research on the ground to try to really develop new novel practices and learn from each other. During that period, we aim to really share the knowledge between different hubs regions, different case studies. There is maybe there is lots of similarities, but also there are distinctive uh, challenges how we can learn from the good practice from Tunisia, if I'm in India or in Iraq, and how we can really see the innovative solutions that communities achieved in India to really inform similar practices in Egypt. This has been really a, a very important and big learning experience over the past year. Next phase, I will talk about it later, but just what I would like to really highlight at this stage that during that period, we have learned a lot. It has been an incredibly um, a fantastic experience and it has exceeded our expectations by a long distance. It must be acknowledged that while during that period we have been awarded large grants from the, Arch, uh, the Arts and Human Research Council, the pandemic came and the UK government had to cut much of its funding in, in, in international development and unfortunately after we have been uh, we have secured two larger grants. This grants or awards has been taken back or has been withdrawn, leaving us in a very difficult situation where we can really not uh, cover the most of the research costs and actions that we plan to have. Yet, and this to credit to everyone, because of the shared values and the shared interest in such an important topic, we have relied a lot in the incredible contribution and support from our local partners in each region, the coordinators who have done fantastically well, worked hard day and night, and really to the, we have relied a lot on their goodwill to really deliver world-class research, even with the little and limited resources. But at the same time, we found challenges. So it was not, never a straightforward. We have some partners withdrawn, we have people really could not really deliver, and we had to cope was a situation where all those workshops and conferences were supposed to take place in countries. So we had to move to a virtual environment. We have to conduct every meetings, most of the meetings with the researchers virtually, yet the researchers, they have to do much of the work and they have to do the work on the ground. So we're merely trying to exchange how knowledge about methodological approaches, how we can gather data in the, a pandemic and during a pandemic, how to really engage with people under severe restrictions. And we could not really make face to face since even much of that work has even started. This posed some challenges and we understood that, we, that not all uh, regional hubs will start at the same time with the same strength. So we started initially with Iraq, then we moved to India and the work has developed much, but later to their credit, from Tunisia Hub, Majdi and Gadel Adi, Dr. Majdi Faleh and Professor Gadel Adi both accepted the challenge to join such a developing and growing network and really have come to a very difficult period and really pulled the weight of fantastic lineup, case studies, incredible a number of organizations to cover a unique part in North Africa. So as much as we have tried to really cope with a limitation of funding, limit, a lot of challenges, we did the little part. The vast majority of that part of collaboration and work has been taking place in each one of those incredible uh, regional hubs. And to their credits, also the academics and researchers, NGOs, policymakers really came once the invitation went initially, they came 
calling to uh, with interest to engage in such conversations. So we are incredibly indebted for the generosity of researchers, NGOs, policymakers, and organizations, each one of the regional hubs. Uh, but we promise them that, as we promised initially, that this, re this is very important cause and very important research network that will have a major change of, of, of certain paradigms and conceptions, and we are determined for this to continue. Having enough talking myself, you have heard me a few times, what I would like to now to share that information to ask each one of the hub coordinators to really talk about their experience and having been part of this. How did they think that this go and where we can go next? So should I start with where we ended and start with Tom in India and then we go on a reverse order, then Gad, then Magdi, then uh, Sabi, if that's okay. Tom, the stage is yours. Please, in a few minutes, just if you can reflect on your experience during that period. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Gamal. Um, needless to say, it has been a, it has been a real pleasure to be part part of this network. I think uh, uh, we we have as an organization we have learned a lot. We've also, I think, uh, I'm also uh, possibly speaking for uh, the partners of India Hub. This has been an enriching experience. Uh, most of the partners have been uh, very keenly engaged in the aspect of heritage and its uh, various uh, nuances. But then uh, engaging, coming together as a collective, it's been, a, it's been an experience that's been enriching for uh, all of us. And I think one thing that has been very, very clear is the role of heritage in the lives of communities, no matter which part of the world uh, they are living in. And that's something which we have learned uh, from being part of this, be it in, the, uh, in Egypt or Tunisia or you know, other parts of the world or India, or South Asia, that connect between heritage and lives of the communities. I think that's, uh, that's been uh, one of the key aspects that uh, that has come out through this uh, engagement of the last uh, year, uh, year and a half. And diving into that is also a way to find a way of, or ways of making the world a better place and a more sustainable place and less conflict driven. I think uh, heritage, in heritage, there is a key to making the world, definitely making the world a better place and a more sustainable one and a less uh, conflict-ridden one. Just reflecting on uh, what might be some gap areas, I think one area that we may have a bit of a long way to go is the area of heritage and policies. To unbundle heritage from its uh, kind of exotic baggage and have them have a bearing on national as well as uh, international policies. I think that's something possibly we could kind of spend uh, more energies on or focused energies on so that the rich um, lessons that we've got or the, um, what we have witnessed uh, both through our networks as well as other uh, works of other people kind of bears a uh, uh, it has a bearing on policies that are both national as well as uh, international. I hope that's something which we can work on. We would definitely like to look at uh, that aspect uh, from the perspective of both uh, uh, Praxis as well as uh, India Hub. I'll stop here and uh, if Anusha has anything to add on, she has been much more uh, closely associated with the Hub and its activities than me. Yes, please, Anusha, if you come on board and then play, please add a few comments and feedback. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. So uh, I think one thing I'd just like to start off with was it's been an incredible experience just being part of uh, this network from the beginning. Um, 
and uh, also being able to like during the uh, hub launch conference itself and the Iraq uh, Iraq hub uh, launch conference before that, uh, there was one sense that this is not just uh, something that is happening in some part of the world, but it is something that has a potential to be um, much more uh, integrated with uh, what is with what is what we are calling the global agenda right now, and it is a very global thing that's happening. Um, just two points that I would like to add is uh, to what Tom has already said is um, one thing is related to like also uh, one thing is related to maybe just having a think about how to make uh, um, the flag bearers of um, international uh, heritage and uh, culture uh, more accountable towards their actions uh, so that they can be uh, held account accountable to basic principles of human rights and uh, that can be some drawn from some of the lessons that uh, uh, have come through from the India Hub presentations also. Uh, that is one thing. And the second thing is uh, the element of community. When we are talking about community participation in conservation of heritage, how to make it um, community led and also how to make it uh, integrated with uh, various other aspects like livelihood, because those are essential in the current pandemic situation, because it's a, it's a, um, these are a, a questions that are very deeply and intrinsically related. Uh, so it is also important for us to think about it in that uh, context of uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Tom, and thanks, Anusha. And definitely the area of policy is one of those many strands that needs to be developed. I think one of the things that you are looking at policy is how they always policy overlook communities and their needs. And that's where we, to be honest, we have been in the first year learning about those kind of evidence gathering from the ground, from the communities, the shortage needs and challenges. And at some point, like what we did in Iraq, which we'll hear in a minute, and in the work that uh, Jigna did in India as well, looking at the role of cultural institutions, government institutions, and how this could facilitate and enable and could be a part of a larger contribution to communities rather than just only top-down decision-making about funding. There is a lot to do to go in this domain. And I totally support this point, Tom, and definitely will be one of the main strands to take it forward. Thanks a lot. Uh, we'll go back uh, to Dr. Ged, and I know that you have joined the network in the latter stages, and still there are lots of things in development. But as the presentations from the Egypt Hub uh, yesterday had showed that there is a lot of work that already have been going on in the background on multiple levels. So Dr. Ged, if you can just, uh, Ged Adi, if you can join us and then reflect on you have been part of this from a start, but perhaps uh, we give you get some reflection from you and how this is perhaps is important issue in Egypt. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gamal, and thanks for all uh, the speakers and the audience uh, during the past uh, two days and today as well. Of course, uh, uh, the topics and, and and discussions and presentation were very interesting. Were very rich. Uh, reflected a lot of. Uh, 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 technical problems for heritage sites, not only in one country, but it seems worldwide, uh, reflect uh, uh, a demand uh, for integration and collaboration altogether to survive uh, uh, many uh, important heritage sites. Of course, work together, uh, both of Nariaj and uh, uh, Nottingham Trent University and your local partner from UK, uh, in different project before and some uh, uh, running project already. Uh, it's very important to increase our uh, bilateral, multilateral and the trilateral uh, collaboration in context of heritage uh, documentation preservation. Uh, of course, we have uh, some experience. All, all uh, other hubs in Tunisia, Iraq, India have their own uh, experience. It's important and crucial for all of us to exchange this experience, which uh, uh, for sure will uh, enhance uh, all the effort locally and uh, globally uh, to uh, update the heritage sites and, of course, the world heritage sites. Considering uh, the pandemic and whatever, we don't know what shall be uh, again in the future, it's very important to have virtual heritage. Uh, virtual museums uh, in context of the new uh, technologies which is available uh, almost everywhere. But 
uh, one of the most important point I, I notice in some presentation, either from the Egyptian hub or others, uh, that we need to, to work uh, collaboratively to educate the community. The community uh, is one of the, uh, of the important factor that uh, will help us to spread this information, to maintain and protect uh, heritage sites uh, from many dangerous uh, erosion, invasion, uh, urbanization, and many others. Uh, it is very uh, a good point to work together to educate the local community. Of course, as, as my colleagues mentioned, policy documentations and many other research papers is, is important and necessary, but uh, not much important compared with uh, educating local community, which uh, uh, deal uh, on daily basis with archaeological sites. You have so in, in some presentation, uh, local uh, uh, streets and, and people in, in some places in Egypt and Iraq and Syria and others, those uh, uh, items or those elements are very important to work together uh, for heritage sites. Uh, it will be uh, my personal pleasure and Ariage, of course, uh, availability to work with all of you uh, uh, worldwide in Middle East uh, to enhance our uh, world heritage uh, sites, of course. Thank you, Gamal, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Gerd, a lot, uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, really appreciate the input you mentioned. And one thing that sometimes people overlook that the importance of heritage sites to the economics and well-being of the communities who live around them. So while we focus on communities, sometimes that in a place like Egypt, you will understand how the preservation of heritage sites, maintaining tourism, becomes integral to the lives and incomes and well-being of many communities which is the important thing that we perhaps we focus on it in Egypt. And this shows perhaps the distinctive nature of different challenges in different contexts. But of, of course, important thing as well, that whatever we can do for the next two or three, 10 years, it will never include all cases. And because as we have seen in the Egyptian hub presentations yesterday, there's equivalent uh, communities with their heritage in certain Islam communities or in the Esbat project, or some areas uh, which is some neglected is still perhaps they have their own immaterial heritage that's perhaps disconnected from the uh, world heritage site. So the importance of both are critical. And I think we need to keep addressing them uh, uh, for that in that sense. But uh, it's just incredible work, Dr. Uh, Gad, and I really appreciate the work that has taken place in Egypt. Now over to Tunisia and Magdi, uh, Dr. Majri Faleh. If you can really come or forget about the titles, sorry about that. Just no, no, forget about the titles. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gamal, for uh, inviting me. Thank you all for uh, being here. It was a very enriching experience looking at diversity of case studies all the way from the UK, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, Iraq, and uh, India, and Iran as well. So it's really a pleasure to be here at the concluding session of the third international uh, conference for the engaged conference on humanitarian heritage. Now, uh, the primary purpose of uh, was to offer an understanding of the debates on community heritage, human oriented development, infrastructure and arts. Uh, in our case in Tunisia, Algeria and Morocco, as uh, you all know, we only joined in the past couple of months. So this was a very enriching experience. The meeting was also an opportunity to start discussion on uh, heritage issues, the, uh, to find commonalities between uh, you know, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, et cetera, in terms of debates, in terms of the uh, importance of, of these debates in the 21st century. So uh, myself, as someone who works at the intersection of architecture history and glo global studies or globalization studies, I, I'd say I strongly believe that uh, this uh, initiative, the Engage Humanitarian Network, was a success in, uh, in terms of support and the idea of resilient community through uh, empowering tangible and tangible heritage, through learning about uh, not only the physical heritage, the built environment, but also poetry, but also other forms of intangible heritage. So for us, Tunisia, for instance, it was uh, uh, one interesting opportunity uh, open up uh, to the English speaking world, because as you know, Tunisia is more mostly a francophone country, university, uh, universities tend to 
open up more to uh, French-speaking uh, universities institutions. So this was uh, a first a start for uh, even for architecture schools in the country. And myself as a hub coordinator, uh, truly thankful, of course, to everyone. In terms of the uh, conference itself, uh, I think our speakers discussed uh, a range, a wide range of topics, ranging from policy making, heritage for mar marginalized communities, uh, case studies from across, as I mentioned, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. And they emphasized uh, practices of sustainable and more so resilient uh, communities, sustainable preservation strategies, heritage management plans, etc. What was interesting is that uh, some speakers that found commonalities, debates started uh, all the way from the UK to Tunisia. Core collaborations, building networks was, was very important as well for, uh, for Tunisia and the region, but, uh, but also uh, different opinion uh, between speakers, between institutions, and that's what's important about these initiatives. So we don't all need to agree. We have different opinions, different approaches to heritage, uh, different policies, ideolo ideologies, and uh, so on and uh, so forth. So uh, I really believe in this uh, age and time, as my colleagues mentioned, community-led initiatives uh, in relation to heritage, sustainability, health, especially in the context of COVID-19, are of great importance and uh, interest uh, humanitarian human rights are equally important, respecting diversity as well. And this is an issue that we grapple with myself, uh, living, having lived in the US, Australia, all over the place, basically. Uh, respecting diversity uh, in the context of increasing right-wing politics on one hand, fundamentalism on the other hand. Uh, really is, is important through understanding the tangible and tangible approaches, through uh, understanding those uh, bits and pieces, those differences in relation to this one community or this other community, and appreciating that and valuing that and preserving that and taking it to another level, basically, by sharing it through these uh, platforms. So uh, that is... Uh, um, these are my, my thoughts as someone who joined recently, as someone who helped to set up the uh, Tunisia Hub, and I look forward to more collaboration to continue this discussion in the near future, and really bridging, um, creating more bridges uh, across. You know? So there is a lot of interest, even, even from Australia uh, recently, on to work on, uh, on North Africa, on Tunisia, so uh, I hope to to be able to create those bridges from east to west through through North Africa, Middle East. Thank you all. Thanks, Atmarji. And uh, as you highlighted, you just uh, did an incredible job within a, a short period of time, assembling an impressive line of speakers, a lineup of speakers and, and case studies. And one thing perhaps to highlight, as you mentioned, just the initiatives from community, social enterprises, how a, a community representatives and and, uh, and um, entrepreneurs and uh, took the initiative to develop this kind of uh, impressive projects. And this is what we have seen as a rich experience from the Tunisia Hub, similar to some of the examples that we have seen in other hubs as well. But this is one of the things about really engaging and learning through those experiences and successful examples on the ground and to share that knowledge across. And I have received comments along the panels about people need to learn more about case studies, and I promised them. I told them these are those are case studies from Engage Network that will develop further, and I promised them that we will be publishing those case studies in details over the next few months. But it was really a short, but really quick and fast. But I am sure that this will be a, something to the long term to develop. Uh, now we'll move to uh, Sabih Farhan, uh, the coordinator for the Iraqi Hub. Uh, Sabih, if you can join us, please. Yes, please. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Jamal, for Without, inviting... without titles, Zavia. <laughs> Forget our titles, <laughs> Gamal. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. I, I can't thank you, Professor <laughs> Jamal, for inviting uh, me uh, to the closing session to summarize some of the uh, main points for uh, Iraq Hub. I hope that you all have enjoyed Afamal uh, with the wonderful uh, speakers, topics, and presentations uh, during uh, the last two days uh, and uh, 
uh, the day as, as well. It's great to see the uh, interest in humanitarian heritage across the network uh, to uh, promote uh, peace building, uh, cultural exchange, and uh, psychoeconomic development, working uh, collaboratively with research partners and uh, communities. Uh, yet, as a result, too many years of conflict uh, and uh, unsettled political environment, Iraq witnessed multiple crises, tension, uh, successive uh, episodes of ethics, uh, violence between and in certain urban social that it transformed many Iraqi cities and it threatened their distinctive uh, heritage. Thus, the Iraq Hub of Engaged Network worked to develop a transformative, equitable partnership, dialogues, and meeting uh, to set proper methods, uh, techniques uh, that mobilize to study different topics uh, of the heritage of Iraqi uh, communities. Uh, the work that we have shared and collaborated uh, with the Engage Network uh, has aimed to uh, have a structural, uh, conceptual, and a policy impact. Uh, one of the most important results of our work was identify the gap that we found in the need of a new regulations and norms to uh, set to the uh, in tangible heritage which seem to be uh, fading. But more important, uh, the social inclusion, job creation, regeneration, and uh, invasing cultural diversity are the cultural focus on safeguarding our heritage and uh, building peace. As our uh, regional Iraqi uh, team and this great network, Three important lessons we have uh, gained from the engagement with the Engage Network team. Firstly, the organization and optimization of the research team members were important in identifying appropriate agenda, methodology, uh, and delivery plan, and also building an integrated model that studies different topics of the Iraqi heritage. The second, creating a reversible system which supports research uh, concept, uh, process, uh, and uh, uh, measures uh, has been shown its impact across uh, a structural organization. Thirdly, uh, the power of human humanitarian heritage. Uh, the power of humanitarian heritage, mainly uh, the intangible assets, can be uh, involved in the co-design and co-production of heritage research uh, challenges and creative solutions which save the existing Iraqi cultural diversity. This kind of power helps to counter cultural uh, conflict. Finally, on behalf of Iraq Hub, I would like to express my appreciation to all the uh, participants for taking time out of uh, your busy youths to attend the seminars and to all our organizations for inviting excellent participants to the seminar. Looking forward to meeting you in person one day and take our discussion further. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Al Sabih. And it was really great and eye-opening how many academics and research organizations in Iraq joined us in the first workshop, uh, which is, I think, exceeded 40, which was quite impressive, including the Minister of Culture and a representative of the Minister of Higher Education in Iraq, who bought into this agenda and understood and underlined their importance to Iraqi heritage, which is one of those I have really lost to a lot of conflict recently. But it was rich experience in Iraq to learn and to engage with many uh, uh, partners. 
I will have to go considering the time to uh, ask Jihan if you would like as a co-investigator from the UK, if you can reflect a little bit uh, in a short, in a brief statement, please, we, then we can really move uh, to the final conclusion and statement. Um, thank you very much, Gemal. And uh, um, I will just be reflecting or talking a little bit as a wish of thanking everyone first, but just, just a quick reflection on what I have been seeing um, during the past uh, two and three days of discussions and, and, and talks, um, which, which really wraps up very well all the hard work, um, the network uh, coordinators and members and participants and all the hubs have been trying to do for a long time. And I'm talking about years of really hard work. Um, and this also has been happening behind the scenes. So as Gamal mentioned at the start on Monday that it's been really hard work for three years uh, for all of us. So it's really a big delight to see how this is coming up all together and it's evolving. And as I said, the network is growing and it, the outreach of it is, is really very impressive. Um, just some reflections about some of the, the, the case studies we've been looking at. And I think there is very common messages coming out of them um, about why are we rightly trying to engage with communities and how that's going to give them the, the kind of change they're looking at. And as, as, as Gad mentioned rightly, that educating the community is really on the top list of things, uh, regardless of which hub we're talking about, which region and which spot of the world. Um, the communities are really, really thirsty and have the goodwill for change. And they, and they do acknowledge the problems that they have, but they don't have the methodologies and the tools and the uh, uh, approaches to try to implement that change. So also working with them all the time, they are able to identify how can they make the change happen and hence our involvement and engagement with them helps them a lot to do that. So there is another aspect of that is that we need also to work with institutions. So, so when we look at heritage, it's not also or only the physical sites or heritage sites. So rightly as said, it's the intangible heritage, it's, it's the museum, it's the cultural sector and cultural institutions who are also involved in that discussion that we should not be really dismissing them or, or, or getting them out of the, 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 the framework of what we're trying to do. Um, so again, that discussion and that conversation needs to go on because at the end of the day, we need to bring on the voices of the community, but as well that the cultural institutions as well need to acknowledge that this change is important to be able to facilitate it. So um, I would not take much really, but I have been really, really delighted to hear all of the talks since Monday and look at the work and the case studies that I think has been very useful for everybody to learn from and to take forward. And really looking forward to look at the and read the, the papers that will come out of this work and extending the work for the future coming years as well. So thank you everyone from the hubs, the, the coordinators of the hubs, the, talk, the, the talks, the participants and everybody who joined us for all the long journey that we had so far and for what's going to be coming in the future. And thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Gamal. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Johan. And thanks for the hub coordinators which has uh, one thing that I would like to acknowledge as well, that each app coordinator has assembled an impressive team in the background. So we are only here talking, but there is a big team set, uh, set, uh, set behind the scenes that really coll collaborate and coordinate between speakers, between researchers, institutions, events. There's a lot of amount of meetings that took place in preparation. And hence, just we are really grateful to all of them, which perhaps you have seen and heard some of them, but not everybody including myself. There is a big team here behind all of that. One thing just to really to try to bring a summary that so far we have this year was about really collect, collating evidence, learning from examples, practice, and different experiences across uh, each region. And that's why we organize a conference this year is about each region to really gather the whole information, bring the researchers together. It was incredible to see each hub becomes like a, a network in itself was just really a focal point at, at destination for all researchers about the identity, identity of the network, about humanitarian heritage, heritage communities, and urban resilience. 
and how now they are being approached by many researchers locally and regionally to ask for collaborations. And we have been receiving lots of interest for people to join and partners to join this network, which is very uh, encouraging. During this year, we I think we we have to a large extent collated a lot of evidence, and I think we are now still working on the case studies of the uh, younger uh, hubs and will continue to work that towards the end of the year. During this period, for the next two or three months, we'll be initiating, as I mentioned uh, on the opening session, a uh, working paper series, which is every week we'll try to release one case study paper, and this will culminate on having an audited volume of all case studies that are coming from each hub as a collated humanitarian heritage book which will be coming uh, collated and will be submitted later this year. So all that work will be well documented, well preserved, put there on the policy agenda, and then we'll develop a number of policy papers as well. This is basically based on the evidence that we've collated so far, which is effectively based on the research that has taken place. But this is only phase one. This is wrap up only phase one of this network. As I mentioned uh, in the opening session that while we have lost some of those major grants we have been in, uh, indebted to Nottingham Trent University who have seen merit and the transformative model that we are adopting here and they decided to really do help us with not of course as generous as the, as the original major, major grants but a small amount of fund to make sure that we are operating for the next two years. So over with the conclusion of uh, this uh, network phase one We'll be initiating phase two uh, in the, uh, between uh, August and October, where we will start really bring researchers from different hubs to work on shared themes, challenges, and start really gather information on how to, to deliver uh, kind of innovative solutions and agendas. We mentioned this, that this is about really introducing a, a global agenda. To ex we explored it, we investigated, we found sufficient evidence on the ground of the challenges that requires a changing of the paradigm of thinking, not really top down, but actually trying to look more from the humanitarian perspectives and lens at the communities and the neglected and marginalized heritage. And how this is a major thing. This is connected as you all mentioned. You cannot separate heritage from this political agenda, from the ideological perspectives, from the urban challenges as we have heard today in Firuzabad, for example, in some examples in Tunisia and in Medina. We cannot separate them even from the World Heritage Sites, as Gad mentioned. It's just there is always a lot of multi-layered in interconnections, integrations and intersections with different agendas. From the slavery, as we heard from Andrea in the first day, from the, the uh, tribes in India that has been really criminalized, uh, yet still have rich heritage that exists in media and art culture and shapes the society. So all of these things need to be explored in depth, in further details, and will become a strand and thematic uh, direction from now on. So far, we sub got sufficient information, evidence from a number of different case studies from each region. Now we are collating them to drive this global agenda with a strategic vision towards each of the strands and the policy, as Tom mentioned, was a critical one. So next phase will be mainly develop all the information that has been gathered, undertaking innovative research proof concept project in each one of those strands, which teams will come together and with a network hubs will continue to operate and develop those strands and explore them in further details. Details of this will be made available once we sat down with the teams, with the researchers, with the hub coordinators and organize a plan for it for next year, which will take place over the summer. And then we'll come back with a more report and announcements in the new in the new academic year for us, which is perhaps from September onwards. In the meantime, please continue to give us your feedback, contact us. Hub coordinators are there because they are effectively not ambassadors. They are actual leaders of this agenda in this respect, their respective regions. We are always welcoming more academic and uh, institutional policymakers and NGOs and community partners. Whenever they come, we are happy to engage with them, support innovative studies and gather, and we are happy to join and grow as we every day. In the meantime, 
please stay with us, stay alert to our announcements. Papers, papers are very important. Hard work has been taking place in there. And we I'm, I assure you that this will change the way that we are thinking about a global heritage for years to come. If there is any questions that we have just two minutes to conclude, uh, if there are any questions, please let us know or ask directly to anyone. And if not, I would like to invite anybody to, would like to, from the coordinators or the teams to really add any final comments before we close. All right. All right, thanks. If no one has any final comments, okay. Thank you, everyone. It's really a pleasure. It's the credit and we are, sorry, there is a question here from uh, Dr. Wala Mahmoud, but please quickly, Dr. Wala, because we have to really leave. Just, uh, I will ask you to unmute, but quickly, please. Uh, uh, hi, thank you so much, Dr. Gamal. And uh, I you know, uh, like a question, uh, one of my recommendation, if you don't uh, mind to post it, uh, thank you for your uh, great project and uh, the organization of this conference. Uh, I would like to put one uh, sentence. Uh, the majority of programs uh, uh, involved in preservation of knowledge uh, also focus on cultural heritage, uh, but uh, no one uh, mentioned or focus about a preservation of scientific and technical knowledge and culture. So I would like if uh, there will be there will be a phase two of the project to focus on this point, uh, how to preserve uh, scientific and uh, technical knowledge uh, uh, more and more and uh, put in our minds hum uh, human uh, resources and uh, uh, scientists in this um, in this era. Thank you so much, and I will not uh, take uh, more time. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Wala, and I'm sure that there will be room to discuss specific issues as we go along. Uh, and I think that we, as I mentioned a bit earlier, we cannot really assume to have covered everything. And we have to be strategic about selecting certain strands that will connect to the agenda. But we welcome any additional studies and contribution to this agenda as we move along. And thanks all for your comments. Thanks, everyone. As much as it hurts me to say that really, it has been short uh, from the UK side to really to reward and at least to give the proper weight and appreciation to the work have been conducted every half. We, as I mentioned earlier, we have relied a lot during that year on your goodwill and the research, incredible contribution and initiatives that you have taken. It is will never be even uh, give it justice by any word from our side but it is a credit to you for taking this as a research agenda forward. And for that, I would like to close by thanking you ever so much and thanks everybody, including the audience, the researchers who have given us time and, and, and effort. And I look forward to really get them a little bit back through sharing that knowledge on the global uh, scale. Thank you, and we'll bring the conference to a close. Thank you very much and we'll stay in touch and we'll be in touch with all updates. Thank you everyone and have a good day.